we are here with Haji Steinek, uh, one from the interesting uh, philosophers from the German language space. I would say he's a professor in Switzerland in the East Asian Institute. Institute? Uh, well, Institute for Asian and Oriental Studies is the institute. I just say it's not important to me, but I met him uh, on, uh, because he was reading and, and making a research about Dogen. When uh, the name from, from Steinach comes when uh, you ask yes about Dogen, but in an interesting way. Until I, I know his name in the books, uh, I just make some comparisons always with Japan, the old Buddhists, and Heidegger. Um, and Steinek was the first time that I, I, I see someone with Enes Kassira and with some Marxists that makes all these studies. Now, there is another perspective for me to the Japanese philosophy. That was, uh, I thank you to be here now, to our conference. I think we win all um, plurality of views that we need. And I would to have here on the table your book that's not already done, should be done, or there is, a, we can imagine it here in the place, there is the, 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 two, the, the two bands from the symbolic form, how is the, the title? Kritik der Symbolischen Formen. So the first volume was symbolic form and function. And the second volume will be configurations of ancient Japanese mythology. So I like Kassirer's take on culture through symbolic forms, because I think it very nicely explains an experience that we all have about cultural connections and also cultural differences. So whether you speak Japanese or not, for example, when you leave the airplane in Japan um, and you go through customs, you immediately know what that is. You know what customs is. You know what a passport control is. Um, you do all these procedures. And then you come in a hall in the airport and you see all the shops. And again, of course, you know what that is. Uh, and I think Kassir's idea of symbolic forms very nicely explains that we all share a certain basic forms of culture, like e the economy, like uh, statecraft, um, that immediately create a kind of connection between people who speak different languages, have different historical backgrounds, social backgrounds. So while in like mainstream comparative philosophy, people tend to think that we all come from different cultures. Um, and then you have questions like, can we really understand each other? Kassir can explain that we actually share a lot of very fundamental cultural forms that immediately make connections. While, of course, at the same time, they also create differences. So, I mean, we all share in the modern world, we are all part of nation states. And of course, each nation state is different, but we understand the whole mechanism. And so we can translate what needs to be translated because we share in this basic symbolic form. Uh, and the same with economy, the same with science. Um, so large parts of our life world are actually shaped by symbolic forms that in their very essence transcend what is usually described as the cultural boundaries. Um, so that's one point that I think makes Kassirer's theory a good starting point. What, and at the same time, he also 
alerts us of the fact that many cultural differences that we struggle with are not so much cultural differences between Brazilians and Germans and Japanese, but there may be cultural differences between people who, let's say, prioritize economical value or people and people who prioritize law or people who prioritize science and other people who prioritize religion. So the religious people of the world in one sense understand each other very well. They may disagree, but they understand each other very well, but they have massive problems to understand people who are just not religious and vice versa. So you get a much more nuanced picture of cultural contacts, cultural differences, but also the ways that different cultural situations are also um, connected through shared symbolic forms. And that's why I think it's a good starting point. Um, at the same time, of course, when Kassir wrote his uh, philosophy of symbolic forms in the 1920s um, he based whatever he wrote about non-European culture on the anthropology and orientalist philologies of the day and so my idea was um, to take this approach, reflect upon its potentials and limits, but also just test it with cultural forms from Japan. So that's the larger project. And in the first volume, I just tried to read Kassira in a way backwards from his results and see where in his work he, in a way, carries on received views that, if you take his theory seriously, actually do not, no longer fit in. Um, and the second volume on ancient Japanese mythologies then is a critical assessment of his theory of myth and putting it to the test. The whole idea of myth as a symbolic form in regards ancient Japanese mythologies. Yes, that sounds very like because you have some material that you can make a critical comparisons with the work from Crude Livestros that was really with um, more North and South America in link, but maybe there is uh, stuff for another talk. <laughs> I want to maybe talk uh, a little bit about your. Uh, talk yesterday. Okay. Uh, you have a um, lot of irritations. I think that's, that's very fine. You really irritate here. Uh, and show for you uh, maybe another way to start to thinking uh, with irritations. But you have a concern that is really concrete that I we try oh, yesterday to discuss. I'm, I'm a good player and we say that you don't go hunt when your home is on fire. Mm -hmm. And your preoccupation is all oh, we, we need to, to make something when uh, we, live, we have just one earth and you, talk, you, you quote Stephen Hawking that's uh, he just say, if you stay with this way of life, we need to maybe go to, to another planet, so whatever. No, that's, maybe that's not possible. If not possible, you can... We, the children, so my children, don't have a really nice future. No? I, I, I just yet to... What do, you, what do you see? You have a concrete problem. Have you a concrete solution or two? No. No, um, I, I think that would be preposterous to, f for me as basically a scholar, um, to say I have a solution. 
I think what, what I hope to offer is a kind of a clearing of the space where uh, we can think in new directions and create the solutions that we need or identify solutions or parts of a solution that may already be there um, and I identify the new modes of thinking that are present there. So uh, I was, I had this screenshot from, um, from Las Gaviotas in, in Colombia, which I think deserves much more attention than they have had because Basically, I mean, it's, it's a social experiment by a group of engineers that try to rethink technology in a new way and say, well, what if we use the scientific knowledge that we have and try to create a technology not built on pooling massive resources, but working as much as we can with what is basically on the ground so that we create a technology for people who are not in control of pooled resources. Uh, and that, of course, goes hand in hand with a completely different social structure. So, I mean, they created this community that was, that's living there um, that doesn't need to have large hierarchies because it's not built on um, massive pooling of resources, which always means that somebody decides that you're not going to have this because it's going this way, right? So, and if you think about the basic standards technologies that we have today, whether it's built on fossil fuels or nuclear energy, all this is built on projects where, first of all, you invest huge amounts of resources to make this kind of explorations. And then, of course, you want to the returns on that kind of investment. And every step of the process involves a very violent transformation of the natural and the social environment. Um, so, and that's something these people in Las Gaviotas tried to change by developing technology from, from a different basis, uh, which I think we should look more closely into that. Did you not have afraid to be too late for that? We can only try. I mean, if, if we sit still, we know what's going to happen. Um, and, but while we are there, we can try to make it change, right? Um, change the direction in which the world is moving in order that our children and grandchildren can have a human life. Um, so one of the points that I tried to make yesterday was to say very clearly, uh, we really need to change the ideas we have about scientific and technological progress. Because if our current ideas of advanced science and technology goes hand in hand with this idea, okay, we're going to develop artificial intelligence and then probably artificial intelligence will finish off with us. Um, if that is advanced science and that is our idea of advanced science, we only have the alternative to step back from science and technology in totality and what are we going to do? I mean, do, Seven billion people cannot live in the woods. I mean, we know if you try to do that as, as collectors and hunters, we know how many square meters you need per person to sustain that kind of economy. So we definitely need technologies, intelligent technologies, but we need the idea of 
what is really progress in science and technology, a progress that ensures that human life on this planet will remain possible and will possibly, for many people, even become better because a lot of people still live in very bad um, circumstances. There is a really, really, really nice point. I thank you, not just for, for all, but just for your uh, lecture yesterday, to, to bring this point with this concrete problem. I think all what the political position from Vera de Castro all is the same way, you have the same concerns. And the problem is when you take the climate problem and you have so many data to say it's too late, né? what you can make it when meditation about the end of the world and <laughs> if my, uh, as a human uh, we, we needed to, to make something and we tried not to make this worse it was the same I want for you now just uh, if you want some last words and what do you think about your conference? <laughs> <laughs> like you last year never I mean, again? No, or? <laughs> come on, come on. Um, last year's conference was great I really enjoyed it. I enjoy the spirit of really open discussion of people who come from different backgrounds, have different convictions, and try to understand each other. That is what I find again here this year. And that is how I hope the network will carry on in the future. Um, I hope that we can even increase the diversity of themes and philosophers that people talk about. We have a lot of talking about Nishida Kitaro and maybe there are other philosophers. Maybe. Worth, no, I'm sure. <laughs> no, there are other philosophers that are, uh, deserve also more attention that they've, than they've been getting so far, but I definitely will come again to the next conferences if everything. Nice. Haj, thank you. Maybe if I can add one sentence on mythologies. Yes, please. Yeah. So um, why, why I choose mythology as the subject for the second volume is because I believe there is a modern myth that modern society is a society that has overcome mythology. And because this myth is not recognized as a myth, it's operating even more strongly. And I think we need to embrace mythology as an important part of human civilization and culture. And we need to create a mythology that can orient us toward a good future. There's a nice last word. Hajj, thank you. Okay. <laughs>